uh, we're super excited to have our first uh, expert talk of the year um, with Joy Stanfield Perry, who is a very well-known member of one of the local Native American tribes. Um, she's done a lot of work throughout Orange County, um, ensuring that we're aware of uh, the background, the history of the land that we're on. Um, I'm sure I would miss a whole lot if I tried to explain everything that she's done. So if there's anything she wants to add, I'll let her do that when she starts. Yeah. Uh, so without further ado, Joyce, you can, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great, 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 great. So um, I wanna first thank the Bolsa Chica Conservancy for inviting me to speak about my experiences at Bolsa. Um, I'll be sharing with you, ladies and gentlemen, um, excerpts from my journal and my thought process over the years as I've, uh, what I've learned on the site and during my observations there. And I hope by the end of the uh, presentation, you will uh, have a sense of my perspective as well as how the demands of growth and progress uh, continue to be at odds with traditional ways. I'd like to take the opportunity to formally introduce who I am and how I serve my community. Uh, I am uh, Juanita Joyce Stanfield Perry. I'm the daughter of Mary, who is here, and Roland. Um, I am the mother to Todd and Scott. I am the wife to Ron. I am the grandmother to Sophia and Landon. And I am a sister to Martin and Jesse. Uh, I serve my community as a cultural resource director for an abandoned mission Indians, the Hashem Nation, under the leadership of Matias Bilardis. Additionally, I'm the founder and president of Payom Kochim Kamalam, which is an American Indian led 501c3 nonprofit. Also, I am the founder and executive director of the Hahashim and Tongva Land Conservancy. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So who are the Hahashim? Um, we are the indigenous people uh, whose traditional homeland stretches from the coast of Long Beach to the north to Camp Pendleton to the south. And all of Orange County and parts of Western uh, Riverside County we're also recognized by the state of California and the County of Orange as the indigenous people. So I trust that many of you have heard these terms when in you and Hohashimin. So I just thought that I might share with you some of the differences. Today, the Hohashimin people adopt several identities based on the context in which we're operating. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our cultural identity is as the Hahashima Nation. And this comes from the village of Hahashima, which today is known uh, the city of um, San Juan Capistrano. And we've adopted, this has been adopted as a representation of our culture. The word Hahashima in our language refers to a heap of animated things, such as an ant colony. And more broadly, we consider ourselves Payonkich. Um, <clears throat> that is how we, re we were referred to prior to contact by other nations. That means we're the Westerners, the Kamalam are the first people of Earth Mother. And lastly, as a sovereign nation, we identify as the Wanyanyo Band of Mission Indians, Hahashaman Nation. Wanyanyo is a reference to the neophyte uh, slave population of Mission San Juan Capistrano and is a post-contact Spanish identity that was forced upon us and has become part of our lexicon. So when a person comes, uh, like from my tribe and I'm coming to other communities to talk, he or she will introduce herself by acknowledging their traditional teachers and their family lineage. This clearly classifies uh, the person and many times determines how she or he will be uh, accepted. So one of the first things you learn in our community is to acknowledge your traditional teachers. 
So for about 25 years, I worked with Chief Dave Velardis, and in December of 2014, he passed on. And I'd like to pay homage to his vision, his perseverance, his determination, and his mental toughness. And I hope that he knows that his spirit lives on. You'll see one of these pictures here is actually taken when uh, we just, or when the archaeologists discovered one of the largest cobstone caches. Um, I'll go into that a little more. <clears throat> so I'm not really sure who my audience is, and so I think it's really important to kind of ground your, my, everyone in the, the space in which I'm referring. So Los, uh, Bolsa Chica is located in the northern portion of our ancestral homeland and is um, now in the place known as Huntington Beach, California. It's a shared territory uh, with the Tongva Nation, who are our neighbors to the north. The Upper Mesa directly inland from the Bolsa Chica Ecological Reserve and overlooking the Pacific Ocean is located on an ancient village and is an active spiritual and ceremonial place for the Ha Hashiman and Tongva people today. I like to call it a place of knowledge and healing. It is a traditional cultural property consisting of several different ancestral sites and collectively all these sites provide a 9,500 year old sequence of habitation of our ancestors. So that, that's very impressive, I think. This space served as the major conduit between the Southern Channel Islands, the river people, this is the Santa Ana River. It, oh, I guess I should point like this. <laughs> this is the Santa Ana River um, and the villages inland. This ancient village is one of the oldest sites in the state of California. And uh, we like to call it the oldest neighborhood in California. Hundreds of cobstones, or here, hundreds of our ancestors were unearthed among, uh, along with tens of thousands of beads and hundreds of cogstones and destroyals. It is only, th this place is one of two uh, known cogstone manufacturing sites in the world. And we can only guess, there's a lot of theories on, you know, um, what these cogstones were used for. And they um, clearly are significant and revered. And the theories range from uh, medical or spiritual purposes are used in burial ceremonies or artistic um, representations of the sun or the stars. Some uh, identify them as a possible weight for fishing nets or a ceremonial stone club. Um, my research has found that um, in the early 1900s, there was a gentleman by the name of J.P. Harrington, John Peabody Harrington, who traveled the coast and was employed by the Smithsonian Institute to uh, document indigenous languages and stories. And he writes that uh, Billy McGee, um, which is an ancestor uh, in the southern area of our uh, ancestral territory, tells him that these stones were given to women from chiefs upon marriage. So I suspect that perhaps maybe part of a woman's dowry or a kinship uh, symbol of some sort. And um, so that's the theory that I like to perpetuate since it's one of my, and you know, one of our elders that is sharing that. And, um, it's also interesting to note that the majority of ancestors that were unearthed were, were women. So the mysterious cogstones have spurred archaeological interests from as early as the 1920s. And digging and outright uh, plumaging, uh, often under the auspice of studies, have continued. The discovery of oil in the 1920s brought development and extraction to the natural resources in the area. And then, of course, World War II occurs and the site, you know, becomes a military reserve. And then later, extensive development on both the lowlands and the upper mesa were proposed. Um, I think the last real big proposal was something like 1,300 homes along with the mesa, a marina. 
So after persistent grassroots and protests and multiple negotiations to protect the wetlands occurred, the State Lands Commission bought 880 acres of the lowlands from the landowner in 1997. The Coastal Commission then approved the project, but only for 73 acres of the Upper Mesa. In 2001, Hearthside Homes sued the Coastal Commission for this development restriction. Ultimately, they resigned to building 387 homes on the Upper Mesa. It was the construction of these homes that brought me to this place to study. It was with the guidance of Chief De Villardes and my tribal elder and scholar, Frank Lobo, both of which have passed, that I was assigned to work as an ethnographer and a researcher. At first, I had really no concept of what was ahead of me. I understood that there was a threat of development and that gathering was uh, as as much information about this place as possible was essential and daunting. I learned about the post-contact history of Bolsa, but I had no idea how this place would affect me. I traveled the country, compiling resources, collecting and created an archives of academic sources written about the Hahashiman, the Tongva, and other Southern California tribes. The intent of gathering all this uh, data was to help us understand and interpret the extraordinarily important objects and stories that the, uh, Mesa would eventually unveil to us. So with the financial support of the landowner Signal Landmark and the guidance of the archeological firm Scientific Research Surveys, I was able to provide a detailed bibliography of archeo and ethnographic evidence. I contacted to elders from the Hahashiman, Tongva, and Luiseno communities and conducted interviews. And it was through this lens that my experience at Bolsa Chica be, uh, began. Beginning in the late 1960s, the evolution of human rights and cultural preservation erupted into a full-blown organized protest, such as the American Indian Movement. Some of you might have uh, know it as AIM. Newspapers and television stories began to more frequently include indigenous perspectives. Laws were enacted and the acknowledgement and protection of sacred sites began. Up until the uh, um, early middle seventies, there were no laws that protected sacred sites. Such laws have helped to safeguard um, sacred sites on public land. But despite the environmental laws, development is rapidly changing Orange County and still is a constant threat to the Hahashiman and Tongva's ancestral homelands. The formation of a cultural resource monitoring program was necessary to educate and promote the importance of sustainable and respectful stewardship. In 1979, our tribe, under the auspice or under the leadership of Raymond and Dave Villardis, began to insist that archeologists and landowners consult with us. One of our most, or our first successes was working with environmental groups to save Laguna Canyon, and later working with the uh, federal government on Camp Pendleton. So in approximately 2000, um, my own experience in the field began. Uh, I began, became the cultural resource director for my tribe and founded Pionkowicz and Kamalam, or PKK, which serves as our tribe's cultural resource management program. <clears throat> Some of you might have never heard the term cultural resource or cultural resource monitoring. So just allow me to provide you a little bit of background. Cultural resource, resources is an anthropological term. We uh, prefer the term life sources. And these life sources are the remains and belongings or sites associated with our ancestors and their activities. Also, their um, cultural, uh, traditional properties, waterways, and that sort of thing. Cultural resource management uh, refers to the protection of these life sources and ensures that they're handled with dignity and respect. My participation as a consultant at Bolsa Chica spans nearly 30 years, 
and it continues today. Uh, this experience has changed my belief systems in ways that I really could have never imagined. My views about death and life, private land ownership, politics in Orange County, and my connection to the land were all deepened during my time here at Bolsa. During my time in the field as a cultural resource director, I witnessed the major portion of this ancient village unearthed to build homes. While the archaeological excavations prior to construction were occurring, Hashemin and Tongva monitors would observe on a weekly basis discoveries that would excite archaeologists. For us, these discoveries of our ancestors and their belongings was very disturbing. Our teachings could not prepare us for this. Our belief is that once you lie your ancestors to rest, they're not to be disturbed. They could not they should stay in the ground so that they can return to the earth and complete their journey. When Hahashtamin refer to their ancestors, we have been taught that our relationship with them does not end at death, that their physical being and their spiritual beings are always connected to our homeland. Principal Western knowledge is found through systematic observations, experiments, deductive reasoning, it is validated through protocols for review and replication by the worldwide scientific community. Indigenous world uh, view systems incorporate many of those, but not all of those elements. <clears throat> and they are imbued in a larger social and human uh, context. First people's knowledge protocols uh, is comprised of and includes such ideas as constant motion and flux, existence uh, and uh, waves of energy, interrelationships of all living things being animated, space, place, renewal, and all things being imbued in spirit and with spirit. At times, these differences in worldviews would cause friction or misunderstandings on site between indigenous monitors and archaeologists. I'd like to share with you a few of my excerpts from my journal that I kept at, uh, while I was, and reflections uh, while I was on site. <clears throat> February 13th, 2002. The big discovery, a day to remember. The scrapers arrive, the big claw second tear into Earth Mother, I discover the largest, most intricate stone, a large cogstone catch. As you can see on the left here, this is literally a picture of where, how the cogstones fell out of the earth. An adrenaline rush, someone's sacred bundle. I am sad that our ancestors' belongings are on Earth. Their powers are diverted to this time and place. In this case, perhaps my connection with these Kamalam is something I will get strength from from a later date. July 3rd, arrived on site at 6.50 a.m. Burn sage. I need to be cleansed. I cannot watch another person be dug from the earth. Watching the scientists calculate their arise create and conclude what has been an interesting experience. While observing them, my thoughts could not help to evaluate their processes. In American culture, we need to redefine, the need to redefine this prevalent. History is an interesting animal. Who writes history typically is the dominant society. Layers and layers of history, all with different perspectives. Soils seem to take on a new meaning the depth, the color, the texture, objects in it all are evaluated. The wind passes through and keeps moving. Sometimes the movement is rapid, sometimes subtle, but keeps moving. This is what I must do, keep moving. Among my values are the interconnectedness with nature and not disturbing our ancestors. But when your ancestors are buried on private lands, how do you protect them? How do you compromise 
without compromising your values. Spending years in the field with archaeologists leads to some great conversations, mostly about belief systems. For the most part, archaeologists are sen sensitive and cooperative. We would sing and dance in hopes to bring some balance to the place that was under such scrutiny. After years of being together in the field, it's only natural that some of us would become friends. And quite frankly, some of us have become, become lifelong friends. For the archaeologists that were in the field with me in Bolsa Chica, it would be, wouldn't be proper if I didn't talk about the famous Cucaracha. That's this red truck here. There were days that we would pile into the Cucaracha and travel across the site. Of course, before getting into the truck, we'd have to make sure to check that there were no rattlesnakes that were stuck under the dryers or near as we got um, aboard and we learned that from experience. However, it would also be remiss of me to not mention some of the challenges, some of such as my sacred offering being destroyed by an archeologist. So I'll share that story with you. Throughout my time at Bolsa Chica, I'd offer ceremonial prayers and gifts. I frequently visited a particular area where I prayed and would gather some strength. One day in late fall, I noticed that my gifts had been scattered and broken. I asked one of the archeologists if he knew what had happened. He had informed me that another archeologist whose name I'll keep private, had stomped on them. When he asked this offending archaeologist to stop, he said, he continued to kick the religious symbols and basically said, F this medicine. I contacted the principal investigator on site. She removed him from the site. I left a message for the California Indian Legal Services. They didn't return my call. At this point, I was extremely angry and frustrated and quite frankly hurt. I had to find a way to make this archeologist accountable. I had read an article about a sacred site and it struck home. The author had said, whether or not you are a religious person, when you walk into the Sistine Chapel, there is a feeling that overcomes you that is hard to explain. Visiting this historic site and religious site certainly invokes reverence and respect. This century old detailed artwork of Michelangelo, the knowledge that the next Pope would be selected here, the history of the entire religion enveloped in this one space. Now imagine the Sistine Chapel with an oil rig plopped right under the famous creation of Adam. Inconceivable, sacrilegious, and, relig and actually ridiculous. I felt very similar in the, when my religious symbol was desecrated. I contacted the Native American Heritage Commission who offered me some really great guidance. They recommended I contact the Attorney General's office. After explaining to the Attorney General office representative, she advised me that I could press charges under the Ralph Act as a hate crime at most and harassment at the least. I chose not to proceed with pressing charges. I knew that most archaeologists did not act in this way and had a sense of reverence and respect and hoped that through this incident, few future acts of hate could be avoided and a greater respect for indigenous people's beliefs would be reached. I worked with Dr. Lynn H. Gamble, who at the time was the chair of the Professional Standards and Guidelines Committee, Committee for the Society for California Archaeology to propose changes to the SCA's Code of Ethics Guidelines. Ultimately, the society's ethical guidelines were updated to include the responsibility of archaeologists to support the rights of Native Americans or other ethnic groups to practice their ceremonial traditions on or near sites, in labs, around artifacts or other locations, as well as prohibiting archaeologists from knowingly 
destroying, defacing, or desecrating a Native American or other ethnic groups, sacred items or site. So I wanted to share with you um, how difficult it was to witness the unearthing of our ancestors and some of the conflict, as well as the conflict resolution that occurred on site. Um, now I wanted to talk with you about some kind of interesting, some peculiar experiences that I had on site. The day the pigments were found, the archeologist uh, um, mitigation plan was to discover and document every possible cultural resource before construction began. And that meant digging quite deep until they reached the soil that archeologists consider sterile. It was through this process that we came upon a lens of organic materials. At first, it was only acknowledged as a geological phenomenon, but it was clear to me that this lens contained some ceremonial paints. I was very excited to share with the knowledge with the principal investigator, Dr. Nancy Desitels Wiley. I had never encountered the red ochre, the uh, black carbon pigments or the white caliche that was so important to us when it came to our cer ceremonial times. And you'll see to the right here, a, um, a native um, that comes uh, from San Diego that has painted his body. The pigments were documented and then the area was reburied and they were not, and was not disturbed, which I was really grateful for. I spent the rest of the afternoon in awe on how the earth can provide such amazing life sources for us. I felt proud at the moment that I was able to find them and share my knowledge with the archeologist. The crow that lived with Frank. Frank McDowell was a senior archeologist for scientific resource surveys. He lived in a trailer on site for secu security purposes. While Frank, Oh, lived on site, Crow decided to make friends with Frank. We started almost every day with the crows shouting at us and flying overhead. It started with just a simple gesture. When Frank would eat, he would leave some food out for Crow. Eventually, Crow would move in and come into the house and sleep with Frank. Crow had many friends, as you can see here. And many of them would visit, but none of them were privileged enough to come into the trailer. As time went on, it was time for Frank to move out of the trailer and say goodbye to Crow. It was an emotional day for Frank and for all of us, quite frankly, because Crow reminded us of our interconnectedness and our relationship with other beings. It was also a reminder of how Crow plays a role in our ancestral stories. and was just a confirmation for me but if you look hard enough, you can see that these connections are still everywhere if you look hard enough. <clears throat> Another story that comes to mind is when the ancestors locked us out. This occurred during the time when the archaeologists were preparing the ancestors for reburial. This was a tedious and daunting uh, process. And many times I would go into the space where the ancestors were um, at and would talk or sing to them and try to assure them that it wouldn't be long before they were back on their journey. This one particular day, Dr. Lisa Woodward and I decided to write down some of the supernatural occurrences on site. Um, some people might think this is nonsense and that's really okay. Um, I was there to observe on many different levels. Uh, we had created an outline of topics and in an instant, her computer went blank and everything was lost. And so we just kind of looked at each other and said, okay, maybe we're not supposed to write these stories down. So I left the trailer and I decided that maybe I needed to go back to the space where the ancestors were held and provide some offerings and some more songs. It just so happened that the osteologist had arrived to evaluate the ancestors and he was trying to get into the, to the trailer where they were housed and his key was just spinning through the lock. So I said, here, let me try my key. My key didn't work either. So we tried, 
he and some of the other staff tried to remove the doorknob from the lock and that was unsuccessful. So we had to call a locksmith and in the process of trying to remove the doorknob, the locksmith had to return to his truck to get some tools. He had realized that he had just locked his keys in his car. So he had to call Auto Club to come and get his keys out of his car. And so he removed the door ultimately from the hinges. And as he departed, he just said, darn, I've never had so much problems getting into such a space. I guess I wasn't supposed to get into the trailer. So Dr. Lisa Woodward and I just smiled at each other and realized that, you know, maybe, just maybe um, this was a coincidence or perhaps not, but these are stories, um, you know, that uh, there were many, many other stories that I could share with you. Like for instance, the day the ancestors called 911 or the day the charm stone moved. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's appropriate maybe, or I think it's most important that I share these stories with people of the Tongva and Haashini community spirit. So moving on. Um, as I neared the time to leave the Mesa, I wrote, it is quiet, the wind blows slightly, and the movement of the tags makes sounds. I visit the area that I traveled and prayed and said goodbye. I say goodbye to the eucalyptus trees, the weather patterns, the gravel beneath my feet, the smells, the cucaracha, and most of all, I say goodbye to the experience. I imagine the time that the ancestors will be reburied. I imagine the relief and the peace that it'll bring. It is important to bring a good heart and a loving attitude, and I can only wish them a safe journey. <clears throat> Through the years I was at Bolsa Chica, many plans were put together on how we would rebury the ancestors and their belongings. There were numerous, numerous reburials uh, with the Hashemin and Tongva communities present. The last and greatest, the largest reburial took the most preparation. Having to decide the linguistics, the reburial location of bringing in equipment, the invitations to the community, you know, how we will feed them took about a year and a half to prepare. There were no teachings for reburial ceremonies. So we did the best we could in securing our ancestors and their belonging in a place that they will never be unearthed again. It was a glorious day, a huge weight off my shoulders and my heart. We had completed our responsibility in making sure the ancestors were back in the earth and were at rest again. Ano, which is coyote in our language, visited us weekly. We came to expect that we would greet each other on occasion. Anna watched a lot of we did from afar and we were respectful to Anna's presence. And at every reburial, Anna was present. At the last reburial, the largest one, Anna was not present. Anna had lied down with the ancestors and died. In one of our creation stories, Anno steals the heart of Wiot while Wiot is dying. It is said that Anno carries the spirit of our ancestors. To me, it was telling that once our ancestors lay to rest, Anno would also rest with them. Today, when I visit the Mesa, I can't help but notice how privileged people are to live in such a beautiful part of our homeland. I look out towards the ocean or down towards the lowlands and I'm grateful that our ancestors are at rest and the birds and the fish and the coyotes, they all still have a place to live. I have come to learn that there's no way to protect your ancestors on private land. And this wasn't about compromising. I didn't authorize or condone these actions. I witnessed them and I did that um, with, the, the most uh, integrity and dignity that I could um, pull from my being. It is through these experiences that I found ways to draw strength, to continue 
to fight and protection of our sacred sites. And I learned that it's necessary for us to hold title to our homelands in order to be good stewards to the land. I introduced you to David, my teacher earlier, and in one of his interviews, he says, everybody wanted to save the site, Dave Velardis says, the state and the trust bought all the lowlands with minimal sites on it. Instead of saving the Mesa, they built the homes. We should not have done any archeology span up there. Now we know more than we probably should know. He was referring to the hundreds of burials uncovered on the Mesa. We, or how can we choose between protecting these sites, the lowland habitat with its fragile wetland ecosystem, the trade-off for preservation of the lowlands, but the upper Mesa was more culturally sensitive. <clears throat> but the destruction of the culturally sensitive sites on the upper Mesa ended up being um, the reality and houses were built. There shouldn't have been a choice between environmental protection and cultural preservation. It illustrates that environmental and cultural concerns don't always neatly align. Well, indigenous worldviews, these two concepts are two sides of the same coin. David always says that real relationships don't exist unless you have trials, triumphs, and tribulations. You can stand outside and shout all you want about the injustice towards native peoples, but if you don't have a seat at the table, you can't make real change. It is because of this thought process that I have built relationships with landowners and members of the archeological community. There have been in many shouting matches, discontent, but ultimately all entities understood the importance of finding a way to come up with some resolution. I have found that in my experience, the only way to concretely achieve these objectives is to have a seat at the table. Today, the fate of the unremaining developed portion of the Upper Mesa and Bolsa Chica is still in question. Currently, there are 11 acres undeveloped on privately owned land remaining at Bolsa. There has been tremendous amount of controversy surrounding the last remnants of this sacred place we call home. Excuse the telephone. In 2016, a settlement was negotiated with the Coastal Commission, the city of Huntington Beach, the Signal Landmark, the owners of Windward property that enabled the Hahashaman and Tongva people to hold title to our sacred sites. Under the condition of development of the Windward specific plan, the Eastern two acres, which is right here. Oh, that's the Western then the Eastern and then the Goodell property will be donated to a qualified nonprofit in order for Signal to receive a development permit for the remaining 2.5 five acres of the Windward property. In 2020, uh, 2020, members of the Hahashaman Tongva communities came together to form the Hahashaman Tongva Land Conservancy with a shared commitment to returning ancestral lands to native peoples. Our first order of business is to bring is bringing the remaining portion of our sacred sites at Bolsa Chica under our stewardship. We never support the development of our sacred sites. However, given the fact that this condition of development already is in place, we believe this land uh, should be returned to the care of native people and it is the best possible outcome. This has been a painful process for all of us. The landowner is currently in legal proceedings regarding the future of the land. This moment of social justice is long overdue. 
Through caring of our land, we can continue to heal, to educate and preserve our traditions and culture for the next seven generations to come. We are still here and we always will be here. As our ancestors help the land sacred, so will their descendants. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Hahashim and Tongva Land Conservancy has partnered with the Native American Land Conservancy. NALC is an organization which has worked since 1998 to protect and restore sacred sites, focusing on Aboriginal territory of tribes in present day Southern California. And um, ATLC's first three years with the Native American Land Conservancy, uh, they have agreed to act as our fiscal sponsor. They uh, also help us with uh, land stewardship and become uh, our business mentors. As I said before, desecration and the fight for preservation are the realities to the Hahashim and Tongva people today. In Orange County alone, there are over 1,500 ancestral sites. Prior to the 70s, there were no environmental laws established to protect our site. Laws established since the 70s have helped, but despite that, development is still a constant threat to our homeland. The Hahashiman and Tongva hold no current title to any of their ancestral land. <clears throat> if you look at the history of California, many California native uh, nations were never given a reservation or land when their ancestral homelands were stolen by colonization. This was especially true along the coast where colonist encroachment on native land began at a very early date. Land back, I don't know if many of you heard of this, but it's, it's a movement that is just catching on with, and, um, it's seeking to reestablish political and economic control to indigenous people's land over what has historically belonged to them prior to colonization. In California alone, victories of land back movement include the return of 1,200 acres in Big Sur to the formerly landless and unrecognized Ashland tribe and the Northern California city of Eureka, which has returned 200 acres of an island to the Wiyuk tribe. Both of Chica's return to the Hahashiman and Tongva would be another such example of social justice and environmental justice to the native people. It is imperative that we acquire, preserve, and protect our sacred lands in order to educate and promote the importance of sustainable and respectful stewardship. We use traditional knowledge in the balance of ecosystems. Our philosophies uh, on stewardship is to use traditional knowledge in the balance of ecosystems. We know that nature is capable and has a capacity of renewal, and we seek ways to live and use the natural world, world without destroying it. It's through this land stewardship, we will foster opportunities for education and connection to our culture. Our sacred spaces enable reflection, remembrance and honoring of our ancestors. We cannot be whole without our places of worship. <clears throat> so I'm gonna conclude um, with providing I, I hope I provided you with some insight of our world, route, world view through my experiences, and that we ask that you support our efforts towards land back. I leave you honoring my family and my teachers and hopes that when you visit the islands or travel through the canyons or valleys or bays or estuaries or the ocean, that you will feel and hear our ancestors' presence. Thank you for your attention. Hoeka, I am finished. Okay, thank you, Joyce. Um, so now we're going to open it up to any questions. Just a reminder, as I said before, just to avoid, you know, eight people trying to speak at once. If you do have questions, there is a button at the bottom 
of Zoom, if you move your mouse over it, there's a button that says chat. You click on that, uh, type in your question, and we will, either Kenny or I, if he's, you know, he's still here. Um, Kenny or I, oh yes, hello. Uh, Kenny or I will read them out loud just to kind of streamline everything. So if you have questions, now's your time to ask them. Am I still in this meeting? Yes, you are. Good, <laughs> great. No questions, anybody? Uh, wait, can I, so can I just ask a question? Uh, sure. Uh, cool. Um, I'm curious, I noticed, I just looked at the Conservancy website and there's um, written language. Is there a um, initiative to promote that native language? I don't want to mispronounce the words. Um, I'm not real sure I understand your questions. Can you say that again, please? Uh, yes, um, I'm just, I was just wondering if there's any um, work to try to study and teach the um, native language. Yes, actually there is. Part of um, the um, research that I did when I was uh, studying at Bolsa Chico was um, we were able to find our language in the, in the Library of Congress and the landowner as part of the um, mitigation measures uh, donated thousands of dollars to um, take these recordings that were done in the early 20s and put them on um, audio uh, and today we have a very thriving language revitalization movement going on that's actually um, led by Kalina Lobo who happens to be the daughter of Susan and Frank Lobo who were both were my teachers. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, yeah very, very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Um, I know Louis Robles, who's another um, representative that we work with quite a bit, I think is part of that or at the yes. very least. Yes. Yeah. Louis was with David and I when we um, were in DC at the Library of Congress. Absolutely. Yeah, Louis is great. Um, <laughs> Sophia asks, uh, could you share a little about the cultural significance of Saddleback Mountain? Sure. Uh, Saddleback is considered our sacred mountain. Um, it is there um, that many um, ceremonies took place that are revered as extremely uh, spiritual and sen uh, uh, essential to our life being. Um, it is also it's um, a thorough way. Uh, for lack of a better term, to our neighbors, the Luiseno, uh, in which we are uh, a part of. 80% of our languages are interconnected. Uh, uh, We're pretty much the same people. We call our, all of, we call ourselves Pionkowichum. So, um, the, you know, just politics and colonization pretty much has separated us. But yeah, Saddleback is considered our sacred mountain. Okay, uh, Jerry asked. Uh, so real quick, hold on, uh, um, Kristen. Um, I noticed that Nancy Curtis had her hand raised for a, a while now. Um, oh, Nancy, Nancy, did you have a question? Go, go, go ahead and unmute and uh, ask your question. Go ahead. Yes. Now, can you hear me? Yes. I this. I just wondered when I was at the Bauer Museum. Um, I saw pictures. Um with the cogs and they had a picture next to some of the cogs saying that uh george hirsch had take hearst had um taken a wagon full of those cogs away and it had a picture of the wagon and everything and um so it's pretty well known that the hearst family had taken taken a lot of artifacts from the area and i just wondered what you know about that and where the trail ends in trying to figure out what might have happened to that. <clears throat> well, of course that happened, I believe in the twenties and thirties when plumaging was the thing to do. Um, and of course, I think the gun club, remind me of the dates of the gun club, but um, you know, very affluent, wealthy 
men would come uh, to that area and, you know, take what they believe was significant. Um, there are many, many stories like that all up and down our ancestral territory of bodies and, um, uh, you know, ancestors' belongings. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the stones, the cogstones that are found many times are along waterways. We know that to be uh, really, um, you know, that happens regularly. And then we have found cogstones also that, um, you know, have been inland as, as well, but for the most part, they're found in waterways. And um, it's repatriation is a really big issue right now. And finding ways to repatriate our ancestors' sacred items, since we're a non federally recognized tribe, have been very challenging. Um, one of the reasons why I'm promoting a natural history museum here in Orange County so that we can, you know, take these items and put them all together. Many of our ancestors' belongings are scattered all over the world. We have people that have traveled to Spain to, uh, you know, view um, some of our baskets. And so <clears throat> it's a never ending process. Okay, next question. You might know this better than I do. Um, we get this question a lot, but um, we're never really sure since we're not directly involved. Uh, what is the current status of the Goodell property? I, I don't know. Um, I would have to refer you to the um, Goodell's attorney. Um, I know that um, there, I know that uh, Signal Landmark was going to purchase the Goodell property once they uh, received um, a permit to build on the 2.5 acres. But since that is um, still being litigated, I, I, I couldn't really answer that question. I don't know the Goodells personally, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately we don't have, since we're not directly involved with it, we don't have a lot of information about that yeah. either. Um, how, I, another question, how can I continue learning about the people of this area? Um, one good resource is uh, Dave Carlberg's History of Bolsa Chica book. He kind of uh, does a summary of everything, but Joyce, do you have any recommendations? Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> um, most of the books that have been written about the Hashemin are a hundred years old. Um, and it's my goal to complete the book that I've been trying to get done for about 20 years. So there will be something that will talk about the Hashemin, but most of which are dissertations. A lot of academics have written about our community. Um, uh, Raymond White, did a phenomenal uh, dissertation um, um, in the early 70s. Dr. Lisa Woodward did her dissertation in 2000-ish from uh, Davis on the Hahashaman and our political <clears throat> um, and um, religious and uh, language. Um, and then the first ethnographic <clears throat> work that was ever done on California Indians was done in the eight, early 1800s by uh, Father uh, Bascana. He was asked to do that work by the, um, <clears throat> his, um, people, the, the King and Queen of Spain and um, to, you know, document the savages that we were. And so that book is called Chinich Chin and you can get that through Malky Museum. They have the rights to that. It, it, and then there's all kinds of annotations in it from uh, J.P. Body Harrington. Okay. 
Next question um, will apply to, I think, quite a few people in this call. Um, what would be a way to acknowledge the Ahashiman and Tongva people in the tours that the three NGOs lead? So us at the Conservancy, as well as the Amigos de Chica and the Land Trust. Well, I'm hoping that um, during time, uh, in time, that we can create some sort of a curriculum, um, you know, that we can all agree upon and you guys, can, that it, we could provide you. Um, in the meantime, um, use our names, you know, tell our stories uh, um, and encourage them to support the Hahashim and Tongva Land Conservancy. Because in reality, we want to be the ones that are telling our stories, but it, we don't have really a place to do it, you know, except through universities or, or you know, avenues such as yours. Yeah, just for example, I, my tours, I always cover history and I always start with, I, co I cover the history of the land and where it started and how it got to where it is now. Sure. So that's just an example. Yeah, good. Okay, next question. Uh, what are ways we can get involved in supporting the land back movement here in Southern California or help support the Hachiman, Hachiman, excuse me, uh, Tongva Land Conservancy, and also um, did the Ahashiman or Tongva have a name for the Santa Ana River? Yes, we do have a Santa, the name, we do. Both nations have a name for the Santa Ana River. We have maps that someday we'd like to share with you, but we're keeping them kind of close to us for now. Um, and um, that was the last part of the question. The first part of the question was, how can you help donate to the Ahashiman Tongva Land Conservancy? Show up at city council meetings and, and coastal commission meetings and encourage entities that control lands to, to um, you know, give our land, some land back. I mean, we're all living together now. And, and uh, you know, in an ideal world, you know, there is no such thing as an ideal world. Forget that idea. <laughs> we need a place to call our own. And we're hoping that portions of Bolsa Chica will be that. On top of others, Benny Ranch is another great place, you know, that we're hoping to um, uh, be stewards of, uh, Fairview, uh, Coast City of Costa Mesa, Mesa, we're working really closely. There's a really important uh, village, almost as, as important as Bolsa Chica that's, you know, in their jurisdiction. Um, uh, the city of Irvine has been, uh, has protected a, a hundred acres of our ancestral sites, which is the first ever in the, you know, the history of um, Orange County. And, um, you know, we were able to, uh, like I said, preserve the ancestral site. We have a room that was dedicated to the Hohashiman with some great um, uh, interpretive signage. The city of San Juan Capistrano has just, um, created a space at our uh, village site of Petutum and we're working very closely now with the federal feds uh, down in um, Christianito San Mateo area to acknowledge uh, our village of Ponham. So there is movement, but land back, I mean, we're getting the educational court that down, but land back is still something we need to really focus on. Uh, Kathy, you asked that question specifically at me. Uh, it's Dave Carlberg, spelled with a C. Uh, for context, uh, she asked what was the name of the author of the Bolsa Chica history book. It's Dave mm -hmm. Carlberg. Um, I don't think we have any copies right now. Um, we haven't purchased new inventory because of our building renovation, but I know I'm pretty confident. And I think there's a couple of amigos in here that can correct me if I'm wrong. You can also purchase it through the Amigos de Bolsa Chica. Um, I believe that's actually who facilitated the publishing of that book. Uh, can you still see me? Yes. Okay, good. Yes, just... You're good. Great. Okay. Uh, could Amigos provide links on their website to the, um, that, Nancy, that would be a question for the Amigos. Um, 
I believe they do though have information about uh, Bolsa Chica's native people on their website, but I don't know for certain. Um, I believe all three of us do, so it wouldn't be a far stretch. The, the Amigos website has a page for merchandise and the book is for sale on there. Perfect, thank you. And it's for sale at our tours. Perfect, thank you so much. Yeah, I knew you guys sold it. Um, I just wasn't 100% sure where. And honestly, I looked it up for something related to our California Nat Naturalist program. And people were selling it on Amazon and eBay for like $70 a copy. And I was like, no, 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 don't go there. Stop, no, stop that. <laughs> so good to know you guys have it because we definitely don't have any left. Yeah, no, we, we sell it for $20. Perfect. So there you go. If you'd like the Bolsa Chica history book, um, the Amigos de Bolsa Chica website or their tours are the place to go. Um, the only copy we have lives on my desk and I spilled cranberry juice on it a few weeks ago. So that's not in any condition to be sold. Um, oh, thank you for answering the question for me, Steve. I didn't notice that. Um, Helen asked, could you say more about the village at the Bolsa Chica site? Had been I had been told the Bolsa Chica was more of a seasonal site. Was the village a permanent residence for Native people, or is that kind of an unknown status? It was a permanent, re <clears throat> a permanent residence. Uh, carbon dates have um, proven occupation uh, for 9,500 years continuous. And I assume that's carbon dating of like artifacts and the like? No, no, we, no. Uh, uh, it, it had mostly to do with uh, shell, you know, or um, other um, items that were culturally sensitive. We, we, are, we don't authorize any kind of destructive analysis on our ancestors but you know we're we uh, just authorize basically you know if it's a man or a woman and their estimated age but no, nothing that would provide any um, destructive analysis but it was not just a seasonal site it was a functioning uh, huge uh, residential area Okay. All righty. Does anyone else have any questions? Sorry, I was momentarily distracted by an email. Uh, every a lot of people saying thank you. So great. I'm glad everybody. You know, thank you everyone for coming and listening on a Saturday afternoon, and I appreciate your interest and. Uh, I hope that you'll, you know, all work towards uh, supporting the Hashim and Tonga Land Conservancy and, you know, and, and we can continue, you know, to all live in this place and, and, and support each other. But I don't really have too much more to say. Is there any more questions or? Uh, is there anything we should do while visiting Bolsa Chica to honor the people? Walk gently. Take nothing. And um, praise. Pray, you know, just, just, just praise that we still have a, a, a space that's open, that's full of life. Okay, last call for questions. Okay, um, for everyone that has stayed, congratulations, you get a little sneak peek into our next uh, expert talk. First of all, thank you all for being here. Um, it means a lot to us that you attend these despite everything going on and us having to switch to a virtual format. Um, uh, those of you that are still here, you get a little sneak peek into our next talk, which will be with Dr. Christine Whitcraft. 
Um, for those of you that don't know who she is, she's a board member for us, but she's also a wetland researcher out of Cal State Long Beach. Uh, she teaches there as well. Uh, her talk will be about uh, California's coastal wetlands and how we can move forward with protecting uh, what little coastal, what few coastal wetlands we have left from an ecological sense. Uh, that talk will be Saturday, February 5th. Uh, at 1.30 p.m. Uh, kind of unfortunately, we'll have to do that one from Zoom as well. Uh, our building renovation project is not anticipated to be finished until uh, late March, mid to late March. Um, so we will be doing that one over Zoom as well, since until that building renovation project is done, we won't have any place to host an event like this. Um, and I am hoping to have registration open for that sometime this week. So uh, keep an eye out. And uh, Micah has one more question. Joyce, do you have any writings out currently that you can, that people can read? You know, I'm sure I do. I just forget. After 30, um, I've written numerous articles. Um, no, you know, to be very honest with you, I have a, I am writing, but I haven't been able to produce much. I'm, um, this work is very consuming and seems like I'm kind of always putting out fires. Um, so I'm hoping that before I die, <laughs> I'll be able to, you know, get the Hashim and Tongva Land Conservancy all in order and have something in writing. Uh, but thank you for asking and thank you for your interest. Um, Thomas asked if there is contact info that you are uh, willing to share. Yes, I think one of my slides um, uh, indicated the uh, ATLC's HashimTongvaLandConservancy.com. Um, we have a, a, a new website. It's just in its infant stages. Um, like I said, we've it's just been basically a year that we've been in existence and uh, you know, I think you can, there'll be some videos of our board. Our board members are quite impressive. They're, um, and they've done some phenomenal writings about water and about land bath and about um, mission studies and so, Look to them. They're 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 the next generation. 